Kata on opening the sutra. The Dharma, incredibly profound and infinitely subtle, is rarely encountered even in millions of ages. Now we see it, hear it, receive and maintain it. May we completely realize the Tathagata's teachings. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, really happy to be back here one more time. Uh, let's go around and introduce ourselves. I'm Doug. I'm Michael. I'm Bob. Bill, Logan, Susan, Margarita, Michael, thank you for having me again. Um, I've had the privilege of um, being an interim teacher here for the last three years plus and appreciate having that opportunity to visit this town that uh, 45 years ago brought my family to for a while. Three of our boys were born here and um, the adventure continues. Um, last time I was here, uh, my talk was, the eye will disappoint you. And I spoke about how our ego is, will trip us up time after time. And today I'll continue kind of with that, that topic again. And I want to draw from um, Kodo Sawaki Roshi's book, uh, The Homeless Kodo. Um, he was a... Um, a teacher that helped Coben early in his life when um, I believe is he was a young teenager and he started sitting Sashin with Kodoswaki. And uh, Kodoswaki has influenced many, many people. Um, but today I want to uh, read from this Section 68, where a burglar breaks into an empty, empty house. So Koto Sawaki uh, once said here, a monk asked Master Longya, how did the ancient master finally cease doing things and completely settle down? Longya replied, it's like a thief slipping into a vacant house. Koto Sawaki goes on to say, a burglar breaks into an empty house. He can't steal anything. There's no need to escape. Nobody chases him. Understand it's nothing. Satori is like a burglar breaking into an empty house. Although he had difficulty getting in, there's nothing to steal. He doesn't need to run. Nobody's after him. The whole thing is a flop. So his student um, Uchiyama Roshi goes on to uh, say that Sawaki Roshi often spoke of a burglar breaking into an empty house. Someone who happened to hear this wrote that Sawaki Roshi had said, when you do Zazen, you shouldn't do it like a break, burglar breaking into an empty house because there is no gain in that. When I read this, said Uchiyama Roshi, he said, I was amazed. It was un, an unbelievable understanding. If Sawaki Roshi were alive, I can't imagine how we would react. This burglar breaking into an empty house is Sawaki Roshi's translation of Longya saying, it's like a crook slipping into a vacant house. The answer, this is the answer to the question, how do we finally settle down? Or where's the true refuge in our lives? After all these efforts, the thief gets into a vacant house. 
There's nothing to steal, nobody to flee from. There's nothing but the self. That is only the self in the empty house. At this point, there's nothing to give or take, and there's no relation to others. We might feel such a life is not worth living, but Satori, the final place to settle down in one's life is to take this basic attitude that which lives out my life is nothing other than myself. Satori is simply settling down here and now where things are unsatisfactory. And then Uchiyama student Okamura Roshi, who's still alive and in Bloomington, Indiana, he goes on to say in the case 96 of the Book of Serenity, Sakeso Keisho said, cease doing, stop the separation between subject and object, be like one moment is 10,000 years. Be like cold ashes and dead trees. Be like a strip of white silk. To be like cold ashes and dead trees is to be without discrimination. To be like a strip of white silk is to be without defilement. Okamura goes on to say, that Langya said it's like a crook slipping into a vacant house. This saying shows Langya's understanding is very different from, from another head monk's. He's, he understands ceasing as relinquishing, relinquishing the struggle for gain based on our desires and settling down here and now. Some see it as ceasing is equivalent to death. This is a common misunderstanding of the Buddhist teaching of emptiness. But as Suwaki Roshi and Uchiyama Roshi have said, our zazen is not a negation of life. It's simply stilling ourselves in the here and now without chasing satisfaction. According to Uchiyama Roshi, this is the attitude of living out our lives by ourselves without relying on others or other particular dogma. There was a haiku poet, Masaoka Shika, who wrote when he was suffering severely with spinal decay in his final days, he, he wrote an essay for a newspaper that where he said, until now, I have misunderstood Satori in Zen. I mistakenly thought that Satori was to die with peace of mind in any condition. Satori is to live with peace of mind in any condition. So does the burglar, the, the crook, the thief, then finally see there is finally nothing to gain? There's nothing to grab onto? Maybe it's helpful to see the burglar as our ego. Our ego is a thief out to steal for self-gain. A crook willing to deceive self and others to get what we want. A burglar bringing the tools we use, stealth, deception, blame of others in our way, narratives that imagine objects of great value in this house. When we actually settle down into the deep calm that we can experience in our zazen, we fundamentally find that mind is calm. We find that calm. We can, as the burglar, see our lives troubles as a desolate plane of loss or as a shipwreck of chaos. We can also see our life as a roller coaster 
where we can enjoy whichever instant we experience along the way, meet it with openness, gratitude, and calm abiding. The idea of a shipwreck is something that sometimes we get to experience as well as um, how can our lives come totally apart. And there are examples of how to make this best use of the shipwreck, like Robinson Crusoe, shipwrecked on an island thinking he would die and makes a paradise for himself out of the wreckage of his life. The unpredictable nature of our existence is something we can fear or we can embrace if we can tend it kindly, gently, softly, perhaps we can open to this, this calm, this deep calm that we all have, that we all can experience. It just takes time to open. And that opening can happen like that fast in the now or we can struggle to find it, struggle to attain it, struggle to uh, try to understand it and get lost many ways along the way. But fundamentally, it is always here, right with us. So I'd like to hear if I've touched you in any way, have anything you'd like to share. Thank you. So if the burger or the cook is part of us, and a calm is part of us, how do they meet each other? I think the crook is looking, hunting for, for the gold, for the, um, and stumbles upon the calm and finally realizes there's no crook. There's just the calm. So maybe it's just in, in the finding, in the being with um, that, that um, it's not a place of, uh, it's not an extraordinary place. It's just a place of calm. And yet it's uh, in our, in our lives where we are, after something, create narratives about our existence. Um, we lose our way. And it seems as though when the, the thief, the crook, the burglar finally enters this empty house that was so preciously sought that the narratives are gone. It's just, it's just um, this existence. And maybe, maybe then um, a flood of gratitude is experienced. Um, 
a sense of awe about this existence as such a precious gift. And we just then go from there that gently stepping into what's next and with openness so that whatever arises we can is is available even what we don't like is available i've uh held the notion i guess it's a nar notions or narratives too of um that there are allies and non-allies. And yet, fundamentally, every being is an ally. Every thing is an ally. And Robinson Crusoe made use of, of his shipwreck. Um, he prized saw his life as a disaster. And from that, he was able to, to take care of fundamental needs and step step forward. So while on the ship before it wrecked, he had aspirations and, and dreams of where the ship was going to take him to lands of uh, distant lands of wonder with great riches that he would be able to bring back with a shipwreck. If he stuck with those narratives of like, dang, I should have, why this shipwreck? Why did, why did this happen to me? And instead he turned and saw the resources that were right there for him to make best use of his life. So sometimes it's, it's difficult what we encounter, but as um, the haiku poet wrote in sensing that uh, Satori was something other than what he was immediately experiencing, even in the midst of his pain, he was able to appreciate life as it was for him. There's another story I was reading. Uh, Martin Buber was writing about some of the six generations after the Bolshem Tov, the founder of the city, uh, sect in Judaism. And one of the rabbis was in immense pain much of his life. And his friends wondered, why, why do you have a smile on your face? Here you're in agony. Can't you complain a little? <laughs> and his response was that the pain was cleansing. He embraced the pain as cleansing for his existence and was grateful for every moment of that cleansing. In our Zen practice, it's sometimes quite difficult to, to sit. And um, with with um, this body, with our mind. And yet, perhaps uh, staying with the, the difficulty, with the pain, um, really helps us to cleanse, um, cleanse ourselves. So. So what I got out of this talk was, what, only one crook? Only one thief? <laughs> you could call it the ego, but the ego has many facets. So I was wondering if there was a, a whole group of thieves coming into this empty house. Reminds me of Rumi's poem, The Guest House. Mm -hmm. This being human is a guest house, every day a new arrival, a joy, a meanness, a sadness. Mm -hmm. All these things coming in the house, that's all part of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we look around at each other and go, 
it's all empty. So let's party down. I don't know. <laughs> what do you think of that? I like that. <laughs> yeah. It's uh so maybe a gang of thieves. A uh, um, working their way to up the up the slopes to this house and how are we going to get in the window and all these different ways to go. So I wonder what happens to all of them. Are they all settled down? Do you think they're all settled down, the crooks within us? It's a process, especially when the doors open anyhow. They don't even have to break in. What? We didn't even <laughs> have to do that? There was a welcome man. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yeah. I'm curious about how you, in your practice, um, You know, you, you have agency. The burglar made the choice, makes the choice over and over and over again. And you can talk about all our ancient twisted karma, but the burglar makes the choice over and over and over again. And I'm wondering how you, the burglar in you, who is the burglar in me, how you take responsibility for those choices. Because it's not a shipwreck. I mean, it is a shipwreck. Life is a shipwreck. But we're, we're making the shipwreck. What we do in our own practice to take responsibility to make a way to stop the harm. There are um, many approaches, one of them. I heard recently in a, a talk on the precepts was uh, some of these archetypes that we live by, where if you tell a lie, there's Pinocchio with his growing nose. He's made out of wood. So I wonder if uh, the deceptions and lies that we tell, if they could all be draw the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to make wood, we could actually end global warming. <laughs> Another motif was um, George Washington and the cherry tree, which um, in hearing that, I realized that that archetype was important to me in my life, which is, I will not tell a lie. And that's gotten me in trouble. But when you have an example like the first president of the United States on a story about a cherry tree, I embrace the responsibility that comes from not telling a lie that might actually have hurt somebody. But is the hurt that um, we feel, what others feel, we need to be soft towards it. And sometimes it just, it's hard. You know, there are so many other aspects of um, that come into it that make it hard to see. But the narrative about, about ourselves, um, the narrative about myself of being here as um, I've been, I was asked to be a guiding teacher here. And it's like, I didn't want to do it really. I, I was asked to do it. And I stepped into it, became um, <clears throat> what I had to meet. Um, 
the time comes to an end when when we transition from one thing to another when we transition from uh, being a child into uh, an adult um, the narratives we have as a child of what we like to do and how we like to be free suddenly transform into dang i've got a ton of responsibilities so you embrace embrace that and I try to do that the best I can. Is there anything you'd like to ask more? Or to make a comment. Mm -hmm. I was reading the reading list. I was reading a, a work and I came across a line that's really stayed with me and it seems to echo in everything I'm hearing today. So I was just mm -hmm. greatly appreciate you to comment upon it. Uh, someone had asked, what, what did the Buddha teach his life? What did he teach? And the reply was a positive response, or um, it's, it's not a positive response, an appropriate response, mm -hmm. an appropriate response. Mm -hmm. I, I would just greatly appreciate if you could comment on that, if, if, if you'd like, an appropriate response. How do we find an appropriate response? by making mistakes and finding our way. When we make a mistake, um, we can go, dang, I wish I hadn't done that. We make another mistake and oh my God, if we can see that a mistake is actually when we're stepping across a stream, another stone to step on to cross the stream, we see, aha, then the next step, maybe a more appropriate response is made of what's there. As a parent, um, as a young parent, I remember getting fiercely upset with a child misbehaving and striking my son. And um, as I was about to hit him, I was sorry I already did it and didn't do it again, ever. So that mistake may have traumatized my son. Um, it traumatized me. Um, it recognized that that possibility is in me. And so I go forward with like, okay, what's a more appropriate response? And a lot of other mistakes are made, like ignoring, like um, yelling, like uh, um, grabbing them and removing them from the room. Um, and finally, it almost seems like the way, the most appropriate response in, in those kinds of situations is, is like taking this child and redirecting their attention at something else and being with them completely. And that's enough. Their, their distress can be refocused. And I, um, um, that's where it's fun to take our kids to school and see an effective teacher actually do that. And you get a glimpse of it, it's like, of course, that's how it's done. So it's an appropriate response is um, we have to go through countless mistakes, I think, to find all the appropriate responses that we need to in our life. And also find that the inappropriate responses are also our friends. And the mistakes we make if we can own them, if we can um, examine them 
if we can honor them and make use of them, then I think that's even an appropriate response. Does that touch enough on this? Thanks. Was, uh, I'm trying to remember Robinson Crusoe and the full story, but it's kind of been a long time. But sort of what came up for me is, from what I remember, he finds a, a an islander, his friend, and calls him Friday and teaches mm -hmm. him, I guess, English. Is that does anyone mm -hmm. remember yeah. the story? Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah, and so. <laughs> Like I hear, you know, like the academic in me is like, oh, well, this is a colonial story. He goes on an island, makes his house out of his wreckage uh, and sort of preaches his culture on the population. <laughs> also, he's, you know, the white guy in the story. So mm. I don't know, that was kind of coming up for me, you know, mm. so um, and um, you know, and also George Washington, I guess, you know, a kind of person of power, right? Mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of their positionality. And it's sort of hard to talk about Zen and positionality, like you were saying, allies, allies non-allies, because then we kind of draw distinctions. But I was thinking of this idea of like building your house out of the wreckage, right? And it's kind of a metaphor that can apply to anyone, I guess. Um, and... Uh, but it also reminds me of this idea of resilience and when like cultures expect people to have resilience, it's actually something they talk about a lot in feminist studies. It's kind of like we expect the precarious people to have resilience. So like, you know, your life's a wreck. Pick yourself up, you know, build a house. Uh, mm -hmm. Why can't you? Um, and maybe not everybody can or has, the means to build a house from the wreckage or mm -hmm. has the power in our culture or our society. I mean, mm -hmm. and also I'm thinking George Washington and Robinson Crusoe, they didn't have PMS. I get PMS once a month and I become a monster uh, for a day or two. And, you know, uh, I don't know. Do you have a story that's not about a, a white guy? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a um, close friend who um, went through some struggles at work, um, hierarchical struggles and racist struggle in the midst. And uh, where my boss was a racist, uh, misogynist. Um, I guess when you're a racist, you're also misogynist, you're a homophobe, you're, um, they all go together. And this man who's um, non-white has, um, led a remarkable life where um, it isn't uh, because people have asked him to be resilient that he is. I think it's because of his culture that he's with that there's a resilience within that that remains invisible to white guys, white people. And yet it's um, a resilience that is rich with love and sharing and cult, uh, rich music and dance culture, um, literature culture. And, and yet it is because it's non-white, it's not recognized as, uh, as profound, and yet it is deeply profound. 
um, I'll work on uh, non-white guy <laughs> shipwreck stories <laughs> because um, I'm still of probably a certain mindset being a tall white guy. <laughs> But in a, in, a, in a moment where um, he was, um, he asked my boss, hey, uh, you think I'm a liar? I hear you think I'm a liar? And my boss turned to him with his finger pointing and his chest like this. You're a liar, you're incompetent, you're ignorant which was the, the motif that the right wing used on Obama. And my friend kept his hands in his pocket while this guy was doing this to him. I happened to take a picture of that moment and it just surprised me that I did, that I was able to, because it was, Emotionally, I was disturbed by this action this boss did to my friend. But my friend kept his hands in his pocket and two weeks later, the boss was gone for other reasons, but it was brought out that he was engaged in this um, inappropriate action to a, a person working on the, on the job. And my friend said he, um, he has a young man, went to Howard University. He learned Taekwondo there. He entered into a meet there in Washington, DC at the time. There was a guy there with cowboy boots and a big hat, cowboy hat who was competing, Chuck Norris. <laughs> and he was, um, in a Taekwondo match with a, another student, another person. And he said, um, there was a Korean, I think, judge during that match. And my friend won the match. And then the teacher of that student was Bruce Lee. And he said, Bruce Lee, came across the mat, shoved the judge aside and came at him, started kicking him. And my friend pulled an armadillo. He just <clears throat> curled up in a ball. He wasn't gonna fight, but survived. <laughs> Cause that was the one student Bruce Lee had and he student lost. Bruce Lee couldn't contain himself apparently. But my friend kept his hands in his pocket when this guy was calling him a liar, incompetent, ignorant. And yet he knew that in a second he could have his teeth in his hand. But he knew he'd also be in jail. <laughs> so it's just kind of a... Um, appropriate response. And I probably, if I were in that situation, I don't know Taekwondo and I don't know all those other martial arts, I would probably would have had an inappropriate response. And so it'd have to go through many more steps across, you know, sometimes our steps across the, the creek, the river are pretty, pretty buried. But his, um, his life experience, I mean, I just see how, how, can, how could this guy not at, react, but he, his way of reacting was not to react, and he knew that was an option. So I, um, that's one, one story I can offer. Thanks for your important question. I make my reaction is to say that 
I can offer you one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of other Buddhist nuns, but even there's a woman in this nun who runs the Sasana Shikha. She feels on a monthly basis like how my God had my brother's heart, and yet she's resilient and she keeps doing her, and she keeps moving forward. I knew we're gonna say that. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Know, the other <laughs> An appropriate response and an example of another story occurred to me when you began talking about this. It was uh, happened. I, I wasn't there for it. It was actually something that happened to was brought to the attention of the world by David Letterman. He had the person on on his show. I may have told this story before. Um, this construction worker black construction worker was waiting for a subway and he was he had his daughter with him he was holding her hand and there was a, a, a another person on the platform who um what's what's the disease where you suddenly can't control yourself and epilepsy epilepsy he had an epileptic fit collapsed on the platform and there were about 50 people on the platform too and no one did much for him and recovered and got up and the, the uh, construction worker was watching this happen and then the, the, the attack happened again and he rolled into the subway trucks and at the point the subway train was coming out of the tunnel so this construction worker let go of his daughter's hand, jumped into the tracks, pulled the guy straight between the, the rails and, and put himself on top and the guy was still struggling. Uh, and he said, calm down, calm down. He, he, I, and this guy was not very heavy, he was small, but he just kept the guy down. He, the train went over the two of them and stopped and it took him 15 minutes to back the train up and everybody was yelling they thought that both of these people were dead under the under the, under the, the uh, train and they were yelling and screaming and he yelled from under the train he said would you shut up and tell my daughter i'm okay down here <laughs> <laughs> so they brought him on david letterman that night and Letterman said, how, how did you do that? Appropriate response. He said, I said, that was a wonderful thing. You, 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 how did you come up? I didn't think anything. I just saw something and I did it. And it was, I don't mm -hmm. feel like a hero at all. Mm -hmm. It was just what I appropriate at that moment. It doesn't come out of karma at that point or not at least obvious karma. Mm -hmm. he just did it mm -hmm. and <clears throat> there were 50 other people on the platform who didn't do it and all suddenly this guy just he, he said I, I, I had no reflection it just was the appropriate thing to do <laughs> so there's another approach to the appropriate uh, point, mm -hmm. but also it's almost as though his mind was empty and ready to to respond. It didn't go through a, a fear reaction, mm -hmm. and that's the way he talked about it. And you can still get it on you. Can, you can do this subway hero mm -hmm. on YouTube, and it'll be the late Dave Letterman interview with this guy. So he, he left his daughter on the platform, could have died at, at that point. An absolutely amazing story, it seemed to me. But the question uh, Larry was asking, what drew you out to do this? What was, how, how, he said, it wasn't me. I wasn't doing anything spectacular. I was just doing it, I was responding. 
Beautiful story. Mm -hmm. John Halifax talks about the story in Standing on the Edge in the altruism chapter. I was just reading it recently. And he talks about like right altruism without slipping into pathological sides of it. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. It was probably some practice he had too in working as a construction worker where the hazards are regular. Mm -hmm. and, and it's like knowing how mass works, how equipment moves, how um, tight spaces are, uh, that uh, was all naturally there for him to, to embark on. It wasn't like he was writing literature and had that response. He probably understood matter and gravity and how they function together a little bit too. That brought that appropriate response. Gives a new meaning to the word confined space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. Certainly, yeah. Uh, all of the dangers that one risks in New York City. This was in New York, obviously. When you're up on some sky skyscraper and working on beams and so on, you're used to that potential danger, and yet you learn to handle that danger. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Do we have time for one more question, if there is, if there is <clears> one more? I have one more. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the um, what I what I gather is is that in a way um, narratives that we build in our lives or goals that we define they are and please correct me if I if I summarize it incorrectly they're kind of linked to the, maybe the egoic mind or like it's driven by by ego and um the story with uh, robinson crusoe the the shipwreck and kind of redefining his narrative or purpose um, um i'm wondering if it's if it is the the narrative that we build around us that creates suffering or is it more the non-acceptance of when the narrative potentially changes like is it more about because in a way we need some sort of narrative or goal in our lives in whatever we do mm -hmm. i mean also mm -hmm. us just being here it's some sort of narrative or goal that we have by being here mm -hmm. um so i'm wondering uh, if it's more about accepting the change of narrative rather than not having a narrative Well, a narrative is a story. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's say call it goal. Or, or yeah. we, we do have our goals. Um, there are stories that go along with our achieving our goals or people getting in the way of our goal or um, um, the obstructions that are in the way. Um, giving up our, when, when we are in this moment totally uh, with what's arising, um, we're drawn out of it when we begin thinking about, I've got places to go and things to do and people to see. I've got troubles that I need to uh, ameliorate. Um, in this moment, we have enough air, our body has enough water, our hearts, our lungs are working, all of our organs are working, uh, gravity is functioning. Uh, we, we can rest and relax that this moment is okay. And to 
in many moments in our day, if we can do that, we're liberated to meet it as it is. There are other times where I'm driving down the road and it's like, I've got this and this to do tomorrow, but I'm missing something. What is it? And then our minds search around. And it's like, oh yeah, I remember now. And so it's important to, to scan our life and look at it too. But when we get fixed on it, when we're um, needing that narrative, like that's, and then become despondent over it or become righteous about it, then we're not in the moment anymore and uh, the narrative is taken over. So um, I think that's another place where um, Sometimes they're useful to have that story. Um, it's useful to have our life goals. Um, but sometimes the goal that we actually imagine we have is not the goal, the, the, the real goal that we're after. You know, we're after satisfying our hunger or our, um, our thirst or our... <clears throat> And, and we get temporary reprieve one place or another. And it's to recognize, ah, this moment is just fine. I can be just fine right here now. Next moment will take care of itself. I was talking with one of my sons last night and he was saying that, you know, he can get all in a, in a, a, a twit about, you know, what's coming up next week and anxious about what's going to unfold next week. Um, there are probably tens or hundreds of steps to take before that situation arises, to take best care. Um, but if you're in this moment with this anxiety, you're not in the moment and you're not taking care of what's happening next week when really Next week's event circumstance is, has a place and a time with certain people maybe involved and certain kinds of material, the present, that in a way will be there when that time and place arrives. So perhaps our sense of relaxing into this moment, realizing that that time will come and it will, I'll meet it like I'm meeting this moment, that trusting that moment after moment, we can trust being in this moment and it will take care of itself in a way is um, um, along with a bunch of other things that are going on up here and out there, which is all in our head anyway. Maybe when we can relax and trust, then those uh, stories, even the goals become immaterial momentarily. Um, it might be that's where we're heading, but um, there are people that are looking for a meaningful life and they try to find meaning with, uh, with people or a group. And it's um, uh, important to, um, do we find meaning that way or do we find, um, turn our attention to what is positive? Um, ah, it's time to wash dishes. I'll wash the dishes, clean them, put them away. And that's taken care of. What's next? And it's step by step, taking best care of each grain of sand in our, in our existence that um, when we actually deeply trust that and pay attention to all these different parts, um, our whole life is taken care of. So it's, there's no exact answer, but there's just taking best care moment to moment, gently. Okay. Thank you.
So shall we end with the four Bodhisattva vows on page 41? We'll do it three times, English and Japanese and English. Whatever version you like.